Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of the Discerning Distributor brought to you by Miller Resource Group and DSG, the Distribution Strategy Group. I am so thankful that you decided to join us today to improve your understanding of the world around you, to get some great insights on the economy, on interest rates and inflation. I cannot wait to have a conversation with Michael Gukas, who's my guest today. We're gonna to talk about some really important subjects that matter a lot to the distribution community. We'll talk about what's going on in the economy, what to expect down the road, what's the deal with interest rates and inflation, how that's going to affect your business. And most importantly, I want to bring practical and actionable advice to the distribution community that you can actually leverage and implement in your own day-to-day -day operations and become better companies as a result. So at first, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank a couple of our sponsors. Without them, it wouldn't be possible for us to have this show. The first sponsor is Epicor. Epicor is the sponsor of today's podcast, and Epicor is a company that has been helping thousands of wholesale distributors integrate all their business functions into one enterprise resource planning system. And this has been going on for over 50 years. Because of their deep expertise in the distribution business, they get you and your unique distribution challenges. Their ERP solution were designed with distributors for distributors. That just means that their solutions are built specifically with the right functionality for the distribution world. They're ready to use out of the box without complex and extensive customizations. It's one of the top reasons new customers tell Epicor they selected Epicor for distribution solutions over others. You can learn more about Epicor at epicor.com forward slash distribution. We also have another sponsor, Recurrency. And I'm actually very pleased to invite Sam O'Shea, the CEO of Recurrency, to share a few words about their business with you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sam O'Shea, CEO of Recurrency. Recurrency builds artificial intelligence and automation software for distributors. And for us, distribution is personal. My grandfather came to America in the 1950s and started a wholesale hardware distribution business in LA. And my father and uncle took over that business. And in turn, I grew up in distribution. That's what inspired me to start Recurrency. We have products that supercharge sales, demand planning, and purchasing teams. And we have a 100% free reporting product that'll blow your mind. All of our products are fully integrated with your existing ERP, including the other sponsor, Epicor, and can be rolled out in just one day, no migrations or conversions required. Beyond just software, we aspire to be the kind of true technology partner that I wish my family business had. As our customers like to say, we're truly cut from a different cloth. To learn more about our products or about our partnership philosophy, visit us at recurrency.com or email me personally at sam at recurrency.com. That's recurrency, R-E, currency.com, and I'm sam at recurrency.com. Thank you so much and enjoy the show. Thank you very much, Sam, again, for your sponsorship and support. We're pleased to have that uh, as we move forward. And next, I would like to introduce our esteemed guest, uh, guest Michael Gukas. Uh, Michael is someone that I met on the speaking circuit several years ago. I have a great deal of respect for him, and his background is fascinating. Michael started in construction economics as a leading economist for the Ohio Department of Transportation for nearly a decade. He then transitioned to manufacturing economics, where he would ultimately serve for five years as chief econ economist at Gardner Business Media. During his this time, he covered all forms of manufacturing, from traditional metalworking to advanced composite fabrication. In 2022, Michael joined Construct Connect's economics team, shifting his focus to the civil and commercial construction markets. He received his BA in economics and political science from Kenyon, Kenyon College and his MBA from The Ohio State University. Michael, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you, Alex, for having me. It's a pleasure. And, and as you said, it was great watching you on the speaking circuit as well uh, years ago. So thank you for, uh, for this honor. Of course, of course. And I am so excited to talk economics with you. It's uh, two economics-minded brains with a great background in B2B sector, which obviously reflects uh, the economics world uh, you know, in, in, a, in a major impactful way. And with the distribution community that we have joining us today, I think it's really imperative for them to understand how their businesses are driven by the economic landscape, how things like the interest rate environment and uh, the, the policy of the Fed, uh, certainly how inflationary pressures are going to affect their business as we look out towards the rest of 2022 and beyond. So in beginning our conversation, I really wanted to start kind of big picture with you. 
There's been a lot of discussion recently whether or not the U.S. economy is in recession or not, and it really depends on what definition of recession you use to qualify all of the economic data. So I'm very curious to ask you what your thoughts are on that subject. I mean, do you know um, how you yourself in, within Construct Connect look at the situation? Is, is, is there a different way that the distribution community should be thinking about things? Because there is a plethora of data and a plethora of methods to, to look at inflationary environments and interest rates and the macro economy. So I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on whether or not we are in recession, are we headed for one in the near term future, and what does it all mean for distributors? Yeah. Um, that is such a great question. And, and us, you know, just real briefly to the point you just made, there's a lot of data out there. I think we are overwhelmed by the amount of, of information, right? But not all of that information is actionable or just becomes confusing. And so you get a lot of noise uh, where what you're hoping for is signal, right? So, uh, so having said that, um, the way that distributors want to look at the economy, I think consider what's happening with GDP is to remember that uh, to some degree, uh, those like you and me and, and those listening on the call today, we're sort of on, on the, the leading edge of the sword. We're, we're the canaries in a coal mine, right? Those are a couple of, I think, pertinent analogies here. Um, because what, what we experience is going to eventually roll down and affect the consumer. Um, there can be all sorts of things happening on the supply chain, the distribution side. You know, everyone on this call knows what the bullwhip effect is for good reason. Um, and and uh, because what happens in the economy is oftentimes there's a, a, a magnified amplitude of that same thing happening in the background, right? And I'm sure Sam and and others, uh, you know, are very familiar with that, right? And they have data to prove that out. So so, but anyway, so to your point. Um, uh, uh, backing up just one little bit here, um, when we think about where GDP is, the challenge that I think a lot of us are having is when we hear the numbers on CNBC or the other, you know, major news outlets, right? You're hearing things like, your, you know, GDP is down 0.6% in the second quarter. They're telling you that it was down 1.6% in the first quarter. Those measures are looking at one quarter right next to the other quarter, and then they seasonally adjust it and, and, and magnify it to an annualized rate. And so what you're doing is you're taking two points and pretending that essentially, you know, well, if the economy moved that way for the entire year, this is where we would end up. And so, um, and so we get these negative numbers in the last six months. Um, but if you look at just the, 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 the inflation adjusted real dollars, that's what that is, the real dollar amounts for GDP over the last four or five quarters, what you'll essentially see is that we've, we've created, we've crested an apex is what we've done here. Um, and so, and so, you know, you don't want to say that the sky is falling, right? But we're simply coming off of, of the apex, right? Um, and so, and so that's why it depends. Now, so for example, imagine you're that roller coaster, right? On at the top of the hill, one part is down, the other part is still coming up, right? Well, if you look at those ends, right, you can you could say, you know, well, year over year, right? In the latest quarter, the second quarter of 2022, the year over year change was still positive 1.7%, right? I mean, that's part of just cresting that apex, right? So, so that's I think there's a lot of challenge there, is you know. Um, looking at, at longer measures of GDP growth, you know, they're much more encouraging um, than if you just look at the very most recent quarters and then magnify those to be uh, annualized. So anyway, so, so that's, I think there's a lot of um, people worried about this and uh, there's a good reason to be concerned, but I don't, I wouldn't put too much weight on that, you know. Um, and for good reason, you know, a lot of people out there, a lot of smart people are saying, you know, we'll look at the employment picture, you know, it's very strong, very low unemployment, anyone who wants a job can get a job, and those are all very true things. 
Um, now, there are lots of ways to measure GDP, right? Uh, the classic way, right, is consumption plus investment spending plus whatever the government is spending plus uh, your net exports, right? Your exports minus your imports, right? And that's that's the, you know, the true Econ 101 way to measure GDP. But there's also other approaches, right? There's the income approach, you know, in a circular economy, uh, you have people who are producing the goods, you have the companies that are then selling those goods and, and you know, essentially they have to equal out, right? So you get this circular uh, concept of the economy. So you can look at other ways of measuring it too. You can look at production, you can look at income as other ways to, um, to measure the total output of the economy. I think as we go through some of the questions, you know, that we have uh, listed through here, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on the subject again and again. Um, so, so, you know, the traditional Niebuhr, uh, that's the National Business Economics uh, Group, right? They um, they have their own way of defining, you know, are we in a recession or not? It's more complicated than just two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. If we only were to use that measure, then yes, we would be in a recession, but there's there's more to it. And, and they have essentially, you know, I think a secret sauce uh, behind the scenes that is a little more nuanced than just what I've said. Um, but, you know, when you think about it, um, there, I don't recall there ever having been a time in the past history where we've ever had two consecutive quarters of declining GDP, uh, as we've discussed, without it being considered a recession. And the, the way that Niebuhr works too is they, they take their time. They don't come out right away and say we're in a recession. They can take months, you know, with the Great Recession. I don't, I, if I recall correctly, you know, basically the recession was either at the tail end or was over by the time that they finally all agreed that we had been through a recession. So it's a, it's a slow group to react um, to, to uh, new economic data. So we need to be considerate of that, I think. So, so there's a lot going on there. Um, one well, thing I want to mention, yeah, go on, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to jump in and first encourage the audience to send in your questions. Use the Q&A tool uh, at the bottom of your, of your screen. If anything that we talk about is um, uh, something that you would like further explanation on or would like to understand how it pertains specifically to your industry or your business, please let us know and we'd be happy to address those questions. Uh, Michael, what I heard you say in essence is that it's, you can't oversimplify it, right? You can't hear the term recession and think doom and gloom, my business is about the crater. There are different elements of the economy that go through these uh, recessions at different points in time. And so it really depends, are you uh, a sector that leads overall GDP economic performance? Do you typically lag it? As you know, in construction, single family homes typically lead and then non-residential construction lags the overall economic cycle, right? So I think that, for the distribution community in particular, you have to also remember that GDP is not a real reflection of your business. You operate in the B2B space and there are better metrics that measure performance for B2B companies. For example, GDP is largely consumer spending driven. About 70% of that is you know, goods and services purchased by US consumers. For businesses, you should be looking at things like uh, industrial production, for example, or uh, CapEx, which is measured by a fancy series called Non-Defense Capital Goods New Orders. So if you look at the economy from that perspective, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, but I think both of those metrics are still up healthy amounts year over year. They mm -hmm. are past the apex, as you very astutely pointed out, that we're not rising anymore. We're not accelerating in the growth rates. We are slowing over time, but certainly not anything out there that's real scary. We're still up healthy mid to high single digits on industrial production uh, and, and certainly on CapEx. Uh, they're off their record levels, but they're not pointing to doom and gloom in the near term. And so really the devil is in the details. When you think about the implications of the term recession to your industry and your business, you've got to look at these other metrics. Wouldn't you agree? I would agree, you know, and and to your point, Alex, every recession is different. You know, the causes of it, right? Uh, the Great Recession, the dot com era, the savings and loan uh, uh, boom and bust before that in the early '90s, right? So every recession is uh, usually uh, sparked by something different, right? And and this time it's probably just more complicated 
than uh, than any of those, right? We have unprecedented levels of government intervention, uh, you know, changes to 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 debt payment, right? Moratoriums on debt, all sorts of things. Uh, we had the greatest transfer of uh, of equity, right? The government essentially um, doled out about seven trillion dollars in total. Um, uh, funding to various elements, uh, right? PPP loans to businesses. We had um, uh, pay, uh, checks cut directly to households, uh, things of that nature. And these all created distortions. Now, uh, the one thing I want to mention, and then we'll get into your second question, which is what you were alluding to. The one thing I want to mention is, is that um, I'm a little more negative about where we are in terms of, of uh, the economic our economic position, I would say that we're probably more on the recession side than not. Uh, a lot of people argue that, you know, we're in this really, look at the labor data, right? And I pointed this out and, and, and I will make one brief point about the labor uh, data, but people will say, look, we can't possibly be in a recession. Look at how low the unemployment rate is. I think there's a lot more that's going on there. A couple of things we need to remember, and then I'll stop is, you know, we need to look at the labor force partition participation rate, right? It's it's as it's it's at a multi-decade low. Um uh you have to go back to I believe the 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 late 70s, right? Essentially there was a cultural shift when when far fewer women were in the labor force. And and that's uh, you know the last time we were in this low 60s uh, percent range. Uh, the other thing too, we're seeing generational shifts, right? We're seeing baby boomers have incredible amounts of experience. Um, institutional knowledge, and they're leaving, they're retiring. And, and for the most part, I think part of the problem we're seeing with the labor force is that the people who are coming in behind, they simply don't have all of those skills ready to go. You know, they still need to build up those, those skill sets, the institutional knowledge and whatnot. So this gap that we're seeing is, is harming our GDP figures. Um, uh, the cost of living, right? The cost of um, uh, daycare, the cost of health care is keeping a lot of people out of the labor force. Unfortunately, that falls oftentimes on women for cultural reasons, right? So, so we are seeing that people in uh, in their prime working years, especially uh, women, are are not in the labor force to the same rate they were pre-COVID because of just incredible cost of, of care. Um, so there are a whole bunch of things on the labor force side that I think we need to be aware of because they're structural. They're not going to be resolved easily. Um, and, and of course, you know, the cost of daycare and, and, and really childcare and, and inflation, right? They're, these things are going hand in hand. You got to solve the inflation thing to get the cost of childcare under control. And so it's very complicated. Lastly, on that, I would say we also need to be aware of uh, unit labor productivity, right? How much production is each person adding, right? So as we add a worker, to the labor force, how much more output, how much more production are we getting? That number in the last uh, two quarters has declined. And if you go back through the history, you know you can go all the way back to the early 60s to see that every time we have a decline in unit labor productivity, we end up with a recession. Um, so there are factors like that. There's some other factors we'll get into that you know when we look at, at how they're trending and we look at past uh, economic uh, business cycles, as you were pointing out, um, you know, there's a lot of, of red flags out there. Um, so, so those are those are my my concerns uh, sure. and why I'm maybe not as optimistic as some other people are about you know what's going to happen in 2022 and going into 2023. So yeah, uh, no, yeah, I, so I, I, that's why I wanted to, to just end with the labor part because I think it's important. It is, it is, and it's such a juxtaposition too, because we're on the one hand in an economy where we have over 10 million job openings, about right. half of uh, as many people looking for work, and yet the labor force participation rate, to your point, remains below traditional historic thresholds. Right. Uh, well, it is well. down, I would say, probably somewhere between two and four percent relative to the highs of 66, 67 percent that we saw back in the 70s, as you as you uh, mentioned earlier, and, and certainly in periods after that as well. But uh, we did have a question come in, and I want to make sure we address this before we move on. The question from Mark Edwards was, do you find more distributors using their own market index to map actual company CAGR versus standard market indexes? And I would say my take on this is 
it is really all about your data. You should be looking at your own performance, your own business cycle position relative to what industry you participate in and not necessarily just be uh, focused on big picture trends like GDP or even industrial production, which is what I mentioned earlier. It, it, it is really about looking at a benchmark that reflects the conditions that you operate in, that has the sim similar supply demand fundamentals that you experience as a business, that's what you should be gauging in terms of predicting what the future holds for your company. So, you know, we talked about the costs, right? And, and it's, it's impossible to talk about cost without getting away from a broader inflation conversation. Um, you know, you mentioned certainly childcare and healthcare costs. If you look at food, if you look at rental costs, if you look across the spectrum, we see substantially higher prices for consumers. Those prices are even more elevated when you look at producer price indices. Uh, that, that actually tends to be above the CPI, which is the core inflation metric. Mm -hmm. So uh, with, you know, with inflation in mind, we do have some encouraging signs there. I would say, you know, if you look at the cost of gas, for example, pulling back, if you look at uh, things like you know, uh, material costs, copper, steel, aluminum, these kind of things, lumber, which I'm sure the construction industry pays attention to very carefully, they point to potentially an easing of some of that inflationary pressure. So I'd love to get your take on what do you look for when it comes to inflation and what is likely to face the distribution community as we look out over the next six to 12 months? Yeah, a couple of, of great uh, areas that, that I can touch on there. First of all, Alex, I fully agree with your response to Mark's question. Um, you know, look at the automotive industry versus the energy industry. They couldn't really be um, more different at this point, right? Auto uh, unit production is, is still millions of units per year under where it should be. So those firms that are in that supply chain distribution space are facing a very unique problem, right? And that looks very different from the energy markets where, uh, you know, if we could double the size of the US energy infrastructure tomorrow, you know, that would be fantastic. Europe would love that, right? Uh, the, the, the need to be able to, to transport and move energy between North America, Europe, and Asia right now has never been greater. Um, and, and so to your point, right, I fully agree. The industry that you work in, the one that, that is your bread and butter, it's going to have its own unique business cycle uh, factors, right? Just as you were talking about before about cycle timing and everything else. So absolutely, you need to be looking at industry specific data to really make the right distribution supply chain decisions for your company. So I wanted to throw that out there because I fully agree with you. Um, when we look at um, some of those other factors, you're talking about PPIs. Um, it's been really interesting. My focus with Construct Connect is to look at uh, business, uh, sorry, uh, building products. Right. And so one of the areas that Construct Connect really focuses on is how do we help BPMs, right? Building product uh, manufacturers uh, to succeed and, and to, uh, you know, grow their sales, find those opportunities. And at the same time, uh, they, they are struggling with their own supply chain issues. Um, and we see that in the data, right? You mentioned wood. Well, if you look at the PPI for wood products in the building space, it has been extremely jagged in the last two years. We're seeing huge ups and downs and, and you don't even need to look at the data that's available through uh, an expensive website. Uh, you can just go to Home Depot or Lowe's, right? And you, if you remember, you know, three years ago, I was paying $1.97 for a two by four. And then at one point, I think it was $12, you know, for, for that same piece of wood. Um, and those prices have fluctuated, right? But, but overall, you know, we're seeing those incredible uh, swings there. Other things we've seen too are like, look at the, the PPIs for metals and plastic parts. Um, uh, those have all gone up, but for some products, and this may be very interesting for your supply chain and distributors is, is that, uh, you know, we've seen cases where, where metal or plastic prices will, will move significantly faster than the other. And so the question becomes one of, well, as a, as a smart distributor or supplier, right, do you need to be thinking about uh, product substitution by its um, by its material type, right? So if you look at plumbing fixtures, uh, for example, made of metal, made of plastic, there was a point in time where those PPIs crossed and one was growing much faster than the other. So as a smart distributor, the question becomes one of, well, you know, do I need to switch? If I if you can make that substitution, you may be able to save yourself money, save your customer money, uh, you know, gain market share. So there's all sorts of things like that. Um, 
that I think the smart the smart distributors and supply chain um, professionals uh, definitely should be uh, thinking about. Well, and if they don't think about it themselves, their customers certainly are, right? Because the, 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 the demand side pull from your customer base is going to reflect what they can get that will fit the application, fit the, the, the duty that that product is expected to perform, but do so at a more competitive price point. So I think that that's a, a very astute thing for you to point out. A couple of follow-up questions, if you don't mind, on that end. Uh, I often see you talk about the need to pay attention to unit data rather than the top line dollars, the revenues. And, and of course, it's the revenue that oftentimes gets the biggest impact from inflation, right? Units do have a secondary kind of reaction to what's going on in the inflationary environment, but it's a, in my opinion, a better way to measure your business performance in periods of high inflation. What do you think about that element? Yeah. Oh, it's absolutely true, right? Because you can grow top line dollars. And, and even now, um, I think one of the great challenges that a lot of firms have is, is that complacency of, you know, well, we're growing revenues at 7%. But I think as you were alluding to earlier, right, if you're growing revenues by 7%, but your costs are doubling, um, uh, odds are your, your operational margins are, are being severely compressed, right? And, um, you know, one of the ways that anybody can monitor what's going on there is we look at um, bid prices, right? The, the prices that um, somebody is selling a, a finished product for, how that price is moving versus their, their material costs and their labor costs, right? And, and we have seen over the last two years, as, as many people have personally experienced, um, the, the cost of production has, in some cases, greatly outpaced the ability of firms to raise prices, right? And that gets around to the whole sticky price concept that um, firms need, especially on the supply chain side, we need to be very careful about how we write our contracts, right? We need to make sure that we're not making a, a year long price guarantee when our own costs might be monthly, right? The variable cost can change dramatically. And, and as someone who's been working, who has worked on the manufacturing side specifically, you know, for for uh, the six years ending in at the very beginning of this year, really, you know, we saw those kinds of, of horror stories coming out of the manufacturing side where uh, firms had made year-long commitments in 2021 or 2020, especially, and all of a sudden, you know, they couldn't get product. Um, they, 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 they were simply underwater because of how they had priced these things three, six, nine months prior. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, we have to be very careful of, of how we look at, at revenues and understand that that is only the smallest part. Uh, it's really just the first part. It's not the smallest part, it's the first part of the picture. Um, you really need to be looking at EBIT. Uh, you really need to be looking at, at you know, operating margins, things of, of that nature for sure. And, and not just at the top level, right? Because you can have different sets of customers that offer vastly different profitability returns for your organization. You can look at it on a product line basis, on a geographic basis, because logistics and shipping costs could vary drastically from region to region. But mm -hmm. it is all boiling down to the fact that in a high inflationary environment where both materials and other input costs, as well as labor, are going to continue to put pressure on your margins and on your bottom line overall, you've got to be much more proactive in dealing with this issue, right? It can't be to your to your very valuable point, you can't do an annual or even a biannual or quarterly at this point type of price adjustment. And if you can figure out how to work in certain price escalators or de-escalators de for that matter, right? Into those contracts, for example, uh, simply putting in producer price index uh, related type of elements within those contracts that allow your customers to realize you're not doing this to try to gouge them. You're not trying to increase your profitability. You're trying to maintain profits at a stable level. And so when prices go up, they will have to pay more. If prices do come down, they will then have to pay less. And so it seems like a very equitable, very fair way to approach this. And it removes a lot of the converse, uh, of the emotion from that conversation, right? Because those those discussions that your salespeople as a distributor have to have with your end customers are difficult ones, particularly if it's the third or fourth or sixth, in some cases, price increase that you're trying to pass along that year. If yeah. it's done in a much more neutral and impartial manner that is driven by data rather than um, kind of 
feelings or you know emotions, then I think it's going to benefit everybody involved. Have you seen any success stories like that in the companies that you engage with? Um, I would say indirectly so. Uh, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, and you know one of the things that you're making a great point about is that discussion around price. And uh, when I've heard about those stories, right, it can become difficult when everything is about price. We just assume that availability is a given. And we've all learned that very difficult lesson that availability is no longer a given. Um, you know, you can no longer just have one supplier and just assume that it's that they will provide everything that you need when you need it at this great price. Uh, a lot of firms right, are finding uh, that they need to reinforce their supply chains, maybe having two or three suppliers for any given part. Um, when it comes to price, I think one of the conversations I keep hearing again and again, and maybe you do as well, is the idea that, you know, it's okay to ask um, for a little bit of a price premium if you can assure availability. And, and the reason being that someone may offer you a better price, but if, if they can't guarantee the delivery, right, then all of a sudden you as that manufacturer uh, will have people sitting around uh, not doing what they need to be doing, right? Machine, you, you reduce your capacity utilization on your machines, your people aren't working, your lights are still turned on, all of your costs remain, you know, the same, um, but you, you can't produce, right? You're not productive. And so, you know, what is the, the premium that you're willing to pay in order to make sure that your own operations can maintain some, some close to peak level of efficiency, right? And I think it expands the pie, right? It expands that conversation that a supplier or distributor can have with, uh, with their customer because it, it, price is only, as we all know now, price is only one part of, of the total picture of the value that is created by a supplier or a distributor. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, I think that these practices that we try to convey to the distribution community. We mentioned manufacturers having to plan for production capacity levels that are optimal, but certainly distributors have to manage inventory levels uh, and, and, and their own backlogs to their customers by interacting with both the end consumer of their products and the manufacturer that provides those products to them. So I think it's a really salient point that you're making that it's not a conversation that just centers around price, but availability plays into the mix, the value add, can you be an end-to-end -end solution for the customer? There are many other elements that as we get into this discussion, as per particularly as the economy slows down, uh, distributors need to increasingly be looking for ways to add value to that conversation and not just have the conversation be about price. One other point, and this was a story I've heard maybe two or three times, is this idea that as a distributor supply chain uh, services provider, uh, your ability to hold inventory for a customer sometimes can be very valuable. Again, it's not a price thing, but if you say, look, I, I want this inventory. I don't have the capacity to hold it in my own location. Can you hold it for me? Uh, you know, that might be something that helps seal a deal. Um, obviously, uh, there may be risk associated with doing that for somebody, but but again, it's that whole idea of expanding the pie. How do you provide uh, maybe a non an atypical or non-traditional value for that customer that will help put you out front and 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 help you to close that deal. Yeah, I do hear that quite a bit about just how can you hold the inventory for them. Yeah, of course, of course. So we've talked about the macro environment. We've talked about inflation. The uh, kind of correlating subject relative to inflation is, of course, interest rates. And interest rates play a big role, not only in helping the government try to tame some of the runaway inflation that we're currently dealing with across various segments of the economy, but certainly in terms of borrowing costs for distributors as well. So let's talk a little bit about why is it that the Fed is doing what they're doing uh, in terms of how they're managing interest rate policy? They're all heading, I think, to Jackson Hole, Wyoming right now for their right. next meeting, right. where they're going to decide what's, what's going to happen with interest rate policy come September. Uh, the, the pundits, of course, expect anywhere between 0 0.5 and all the way up to 1% increase on the federal funds rate. What does all of that mean? Where are they likely to cap out? And what are the implications to the distribution community from interest rate policy? Those are fantastic questions. And if they were easy questions, I would have, I would have straightforward answers for you on those. Um, 
So you're absolutely right. The, 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 the situation right now is that the Federal Reserve is continuing to raise the federal funds rate, which is essentially, if you think of interest rates as like a layer of a cake, uh, what the Fed is doing is, is that they are at the foundational level of, they're, the, they're your first layer of that cake, right? And so as they raise rates, they essentially are raising the height of that cake, right? On top of that, you have a risk-free rate of return, right? And so you have government bonds. In, in theory, these are, are risk-free because the government government won't default, right? Um, and so that is that is the next layer, right? If you're a business that wants to borrow money, right, you have some uh, some risk premium associated with your business because unlike the federal government, in theory, uh, you could default. And so you have to pay a premium, which is some amount of interest above, right, that risk-free rate, which is usually like a 10-year treasury rate. Um, if we look at what is happening with uh, corporate interest rates, the rates that our, you know, people on this call are looking at, they all know that their interest rates are going up. And it's because of this compounding, this layering effect that we're getting that. Um, uh, so, so, right, so this creates that problem of, well, okay, so why is the Fed doing this? Well, the idea behind it, ideally, is that uh, higher interest rates mean that fewer uh, investment projects will have a, a, the kind of rate of return uh, that uh, would would make them feasible, that would make people want to execute on them, right? So the whole idea is you raise interest rates, you therefore reduce the return on, on an investment uh, to the point where those invest some of those investments aren't being made because they just don't pass a threshold test, right? Um, and then that slows down the economy. Again, growth GDP, like we said, C plus I plus G, you're essentially reducing I. Um, the challenge with that in this economy is, is that we just dumped seven trillion dollars onto the consumers and onto the you know into the hands of a lot of businesses and whatnot. So we have you know the the, the money supply has exploded to a certain degree, right? There's over a trillion dollars that are uh, that is sitting at the Federal Reserve that is basically money that the banks were given by the Federal Reserve. The banks have no idea what to do with, it, and they're basically saying, "Here, you take it." We don't know what to do with it. And so it sits in these overnight reverse repos. Um, you know, and of course, the the idea that you have a trillion dollars in these overnight bank accounts is is unbelievable because if you look at the the many decades of history, you know, this market had like next to nothing by comparison in it. Um so we're we're just we're so a wash in cash. The, the the whole financial system is just overflowing with funds. At the same time that the Federal Reserve is saying, "Well, look, there's too much money in the system. We're gonna we're gonna beat the the investment you know part of the economy down to make up for this." And and so I think that there's this disconnect uh, between you know the, the the what the Fed has done, what what essentially through the Treasury, right? So the Fed is 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 working with. Uh, sorry, the Fed is working with the Treasury, right? The the Treasury is the one that wrote us all those checks back in 2020 and 2021, but that still puts the money out there. And so, and so that's really the challenge with this is that it's not, I'm not convinced that traditional monetary policy, just playing with interest rates alone is going to really solve, efficiently solve this problem. I think that what's going to happen is, is that if you expect uh, the, the Federal Reserve to make investments, uh, to to um, to wind down the demand for investment spending, right? In order to offset uh, spending elsewhere that has caused all this inflation, you're going to put the country over on a really difficult spot, right? Because we need infrastructure, right? We talked about the energy infrastructure needs of, of this country, uh, the the transportation uh, infrastructure needs, right? We we talk about, I mean, how many times do we hear about crumbling bridges and roads and all of those things, right? So so there's a need for investment and investments uh, oftentimes have long-term uh, uh, rewards that benefit everybody and they keep our country uh, in, in a very, uh, I would say almost prestigious position among all the countries uh, that are out there. Um, if you don't have good infrastructure, uh, it can really affect you long run. So you want to have a country that is investing in its infrastructure, that is is able to invest in new products and new ideas and to be uh, adaptive to the needs of consumers, right? Whether they're domestic or international, right? We need more LNG terminals. We need more pipelines. We need, you know, uh, renewable energies. You know, we need more wind turbines, all of these things, right? To, to build the future economy that we want. 
But if we're going, if the Fed is going to make it so prohibitively expensive to borrow money to make these things happen, right? I think we're solving this inflation problem the wrong way then. Um, uh, so, so, so that's, I think, such an important part of all of this that we need to understand uh, as, as we think about inflation and interest rates, right? There needs to be other ways that we solve this. Um, and, and so, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. You know, the problem is that we really need the government to, to stop spending money it doesn't have. Uh, maybe yes. we've heard these things before, um, but, but that's becoming ever more difficult, it seems, to convince politicians that there are ways to solve problems that don't involve them doling out yet more money. Yeah, I appreciate that comment. Uh, I've made a conscientious decision to not get political because it's very easy I, to go down rabbit holes when we agree. talk about Agreed. Yeah, um, but uh, to your point, if we look at just the numbers, a trillion dollar deficit in the latest fiscal year for the U.S. government, uh, it's supposed to get smaller, but we do keep passing a lot of spending packages, whether it's the Inflation Reduction Act, which I laugh a little bit at the name, uh, whether yeah, it's the most recent uh, passage of student loan forgiveness. The implications of these programs, whether you agree or not, are long term and it's very difficult to really gauge what's going to happen five, 10 years down the road based on where interest rates, where inflation is, what, what the government has to do in terms of spending and not spending its money. So uh, staying away from the government element of it, let's imagine that you are a distributor, you have cash on hand because um, you know, you've been prudent, you've been saving, you've been using borrowed funds at 0% in some cases, or let's call it under 5% in terms of corporate loans to invest in your operation. What do you do as you look out to the future? You're struggling to find workers, as many companies are right now. You look towards automation and other um, technology-driven right. solutions. These are projects that oftentimes cost money and are multiple years in the making in terms of actually getting the ROI out of it that you want. Mm -hmm. What would your recommendation be to the distribution community if, uh, what when it comes to borrowing money, at, even at slightly higher rates of return, versus using the cash that they have on hand as we look into a softening economic cycle? Yeah. There are so many great things that you just said, Alex. It's it's hard to to create a concise response. Um, so absolutely, you know, it's amazing that right now. Uh, Prime, prime rates, a lot of, you know, double A, triple A uh, borrowing rates, if you're double or triple A rated, which is a fairly high bar, um, but even some of the, the, the lower rated uh, uh, rates um, that, that firms can get, believe it or not, I mean, think about it, they're, they're under 9%, which means you can borrow money for less than the cost of present day, you know, broad level inflation. Uh, that's fantastic, right? Um, so, so there is that opportunity. Uh, there for firms to continue to to borrow. I mean, when you think about it, to be able to borrow under the the rate of inflation is something that happens once only so many decades at a time. Um, but at the on, on the flip side of that, right, we do want to make sure that we are conserving cash. One of the things that I've been looking at is uh, data on like new orders and unfilled orders. Uh, essentially, looking at the work in progress levels, right? We have uh, in in the construction space and in other industries as well, we're seeing growing levels of inventory, growing levels of work in progress. Uh, those are essentially exposures, time exposures, right? You're committing to finishing up building an asset, a product, whatever it should be, uh, sometimes in the future. Um, and there's a certain risk to that, right? There's the risk that that someone cancels that order, that that customer might go default, they might close, um, and all of a sudden you could be uh, holding a lot of inventory that has depleted your free cash, right? And and you know if we if this recession ish kind of uh, uh, environment that we find ourselves in, I won't call it a uh, it's not a a full blown recession, but it's a recessionist. Uh, kind of feeling time, right? If that uh, if that becomes worse, right? You want to have free cash, right? We saw that going to the Great Recession on the manufacturing side and and whatnot, where firms that, that were able to preserve free cash came out of that doing much better. Uh, most importantly, the firms that went through that last recession, if they were able to hold on to their employees, 
in 2012, 2013, 2014, right? I mean, their trajectory, their rebound was far better. Uh, they had the people. That was the hardest asset for those companies to find was, was people coming out of it. If you didn't have the people, you couldn't submit bids. You couldn't grow revenues. You couldn't grow the business because you simply didn't have the throughput anymore. So to, to, to given all of that, what I'm saying is, you know, preserve free cash, preserve your best employees, right? If we go through a hard time, you've got to find a way to maintain those two things. If it comes at the cost of, of having less inventory than you want, um, you know, that's sort of the risk that we have to take. And I know how painful it is for some people to hear that given the last two years and the inventory challenges that we saw. But again, I'm looking at new orders data. I'm looking at new orders data in real inflation adjusted terms, and it's eroding. It's not it's not going up. It's actually starting to slow. Uh, unfilled orders continues to leap. We have this, this, this great chasm and someone is taking on that risk. And my concern is that as a supplier or distributor, are you the one who's holding on that risk? Um, if you, again, looking at the last several recessions, every time we had a, a recession in the last 20 or 30 years, you see this divergence where you have uh, much more quickly growing unfilled orders than you do new orders. We're essentially, you know, it's like the kid who's running too fast and he trips over his own feet. That's exactly what you run into. Um, and, and that's my concern for this audience, right? So let's let's just be so careful about these things. Make sure that you're looking at, at that data in real terms. Alternatively, as you know, uh, from, from years ago, right? When, when we were working more closely together, looking at, um, the fusion index data, right? Looking at new orders activity, right? Which is a measure of proportions. Looking at production activity, again, a measure of proportions. What proportion of, of manufacturers are saying that they're they're getting more new orders versus fewer new orders? Uh, who's reporting that they're that they're increasing production versus not, right? These are such powerful measures for this group at this time because it's inflation. It's to some degree it's inflation uh, insulated. Um, and when we look at that data, as, as you may know, I'm happy to share it, uh, but, you know, we've seen uh, uh, those new orders numbers come in below a, a level of 50, with 50 being the no change line, right? So we're seeing new orders are contracting in the, in the most recent months. Uh, that means that production is also slowing down. And, and we can see these things over history, right? New orders leads production, leads backlogs, leads supplier deliveries, leads employment, right? Somewhere between one and, and five month lags for all this, but everything starts with new orders. And we're seeing a lot of, of weakness or at, in the most recent months, I should say, we're seeing weakness in new orders. And that is a great concern for me. It's a great, it should be something that your audience is certainly aware of is, is if they have, um, if they're not tracking new orders activity in their industries, they absolutely need to be doing that because it, it impacts everything else down the, down the road, um, including how much production their customers are going to be doing. And if you can know how much production, right, your customers are going to be committing to in the next, say, two, three, four, five months, that might be hugely important to how you prepare yourself as a supplier or distributor today. Absolutely. I think you nailed a few really key elements that I just wanted to highlight for our audience Number one, this idea that although borrowing costs are in the high single digits, a lot of times they're still running below the level of inflation. That's a very unique opportunity. And when you combine that with the idea that you want to be preserving cash as we head into this uncertain period of we don't know if it's going to be a soft landing, if it's going to be more recessionary, I think it is really vital to consider both of those elements and realize that even though borrowing costs are going up, that's still beneficial relative to uh, spending the cash that you have and then you know having to lay off stock as a result if things do get uh, more difficult. At the same time, I want to say that this recessionary talk, um, when we look at big picture, right? When we hear the word recession, and, and I, I know you and I have discussed this before, Michael, it elicits these very scary uh, images in our minds, right? Because the last two recessions, both the 2020 pandemic-driven downturn and 2008, 2009, the, the, the recession before that were essentially monstrosities that they were kind of like once in a lifetime, once in a generation kind of events, but recessions can happen and they're mild and they're relatively weak. And we've had a long period of above average growth. So I just want you to have a very kind of pragmatic approach to this. Be prudent, 
be conservative in, in the way that you expend your cash, but also realize that that doesn't mean the world is crumbling around you and you need to move forward with, with some optimism, but also implement some of the things that Michael has suggested because they're brilliant. And if you have questions, first of all, please do send them over to us in the Q&A. We only have a few minutes left. I'd love to be able to answer some of those, but also reach out to Michael or myself. We'd be, love to engage with you more on any of these subject matters, uh, particularly if you are in the industry that that Michael now focuses on. He's a brilliant mind and will help you get all of the right facts. So with, with the time that we have left, Michael, there is one thing that I've been really kind of giddy about just over the last few days, and that is the fact that the dollar is now more valuable than the euro, which is, you know, really, it's been a very, very long time since, since that's happened. Yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this whole idea that, you know, we've reached parity. It's likely based on what's going on in Europe, that they're actually facing a more significant downturn than, than we are. What does this mean, if anything, for the distribution community? So that's a great, that's a great question. You know, one of the things that I was, uh, that I've, I've been thinking about as we look at the war in Ukraine, as we look at the impacts of Russia using energy essentially as a weapon, right? You've weapon, weaponized uh, energy against Europe. And, and I think to some degree, Russia is hoping that essentially Europe will fold um, and, and stop supporting uh, Ukraine's efforts uh, because they, out of fear of not having the energy they need, right? In this country, right, we're in this really unique position to support Europe, right? Uh, we have been uh, blessed in a sense with an abundance of, of various types of energy, right? Um, and and so we can, you know, in, in the United States, we can do all sorts of things to not only help Europe, but also to grow a, a, a whole new infrastructure around energy and energy products too, right? We can, uh, beyond just building LNG and, and, and uh, LNG facilities and more ships and, and doing the same thing for um, uh, tankers that can transport other forms of hydrocarbons. The other thing that we can be doing, right, is exporting uh, energy intensive goods, right? So when we think of things that require a lot of energy to produce, whether it's metals, glass, um, uh, you know, insulation, other products, if they consume a lot of energy and we produce those here in the United States where energy is one fifth or one quarter the price that it is now in Europe, uh, you know, we could export those goods to Europe and, and help to offset the pain that they are feeling over there. That would support their economy because now those, those energy, those very costly energy intensive goods can, can essentially uh, be subsidized through our lower energy prices here. The challenge, right, with economics is, is that we're looking at a billion things impacting another billion things and figuring out how does it all, uh, how does it all uh, net out. Unfortunately, right, uh, those those lower cost energy intensive goods here have now become much more costly in Europe because of that parity, right? So, so where I would love to see cheap uh, or, or lower cost U.S. goods meeting a very real and important need in Europe, right? That has become diminished by the, the increasing value of the dollar, right? Because all of a sudden it's a $5 product in the US no longer costs three euros, it costs five euros, right? Because of that parity. Um, and, so, and so that's sort of uh, one of those many challenges, right? But what's causing that parity is another thing, right? It's, it has everything to do with the fact, as you said, you know, uh, our interest rate differences, right? The value of money is largely determined by interest rates in different places, right? Uh, if, pardon me, if, if uh, you know, if interest rates in the U.S. are very high compared to Europe, right? More money will flow to the U.S. More euros will flow into the U.S. so that they can take advantage of that higher interest rate. But then, of course, it also weakens the value value of the euro. So that's where we find ourselves, and that's. And that becomes a complicated picture. I think that for the audience, I know I've said a lot here, I think for our audience, uh, keep these ideas in mind, right? How can we support a very volatile picture in Europe, right? It's more than just energy. It's all the products that use energy. And as you and I know, right, the two things essentially are, are foundational to every product. One is energy and the other is labor, right? So, so as suppliers who have connections to Europe, continue to look for those opportunities to serve those markets and meet those needs. Um, you, at the same time, you'll have to figure out a way to deal with the financial markets that have, have really affected the price of the euro and the dollar 
Um, that, that's maybe an economics 501 class, not necessarily an economics 101 class, but but again, the 101 concept is, you know, keep your eyes open to that. How can we how can we export energy, not just in its purest forms, but in indirect forms through the products that your customers are, are providing? Yeah, I, I love that concept. And it's such a novel way of thinking about exporting energy within products that consume a lot of it to be manufactured. So I, I really appreciate that insight. We do have one question here that I wanted to make sure we get to before we wrap things up. It's from Evan Kinsella. And Evan asks, how do you think the decline in housing starts impacts other sectors? For example, the rental market, the various product supply industries that serve new construction versus maintenance slash repair, et cetera. This also has a potential impact on discretionary spending by consumers if they are having to remain in the rental market with increasing rates. Yeah. So there's a, a part to that. So we can look at, 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 at renting versus you know, home ownership as substitute goods, and that's fine. And in fact, I was just on a call yesterday and we talked about something very similar. We noticed that while um, the, 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 single, the standalone single family home market is certainly seeing some erosion in terms of starts and demand, uh, the multifamily home segment continues to be very strong. And I think it's just a matter of, of affordability, right? The affordability of a multifamily home is essentially what's left for that millennial generation that is still trying to buy its first home. Um, and so there's that component to it. I think there's another very important component that we need to look at, which is uh, the all the durable goods, right? You buy your first home and all of a sudden you need to buy a garage door opener, right? You need to buy blinds. You need to buy a refrigerator, a sink, or not a sink, sorry, a, a dishwasher. Uh, you know, all of those things that um, go along with home ownership, right? And and during the, the leading up to the Great Recession, 2005 through 2000, the end of 2007, as home ownership rates soared, we saw the demand for all those other products soar along with it. And it was, it supercharged the economy. And that's where we saw uh, so much growth on the durable goods side. Um, I think that is a huge part of this issue. Those people who are saying, you know, well, I'm not in the housing market because I sell, uh, you know, light bulbs or, 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 you know, like I said, dishwashers or refrigerators, et cetera, HVAC systems, right? Or parts for those things. Um, they should be very concerned because of that high correlation, right? Between what happens in housing and what happens with durable, durable goods spending everywhere else. Uh, so, so that's really two parts to it, right? We need to look at multifamily home segment is, is acting very differently from the standalone single families. If you're in the multifamily home segment, you may you may be in a very good spot for the, you know, in the short uh, term or in the near term future at least. Um, on the flip side, if you're, um, you know, if most of your business is coming on the single family home side and we're seeing real challenges with affordability, then, you know, you need to be more concerned with, with you know, what your future looks like. Yeah, I guess the silver lining for me there is if you are reliant on single family housing, you could potentially look to multifamily to be a, a little bit of a release valve. If the, the business declines in this area, mm -hmm. then you might be able to you know, tweak your products and services to tailor them to the multifamily market. So right. uh, again, you know, kind of both sides of the coin, right? Right, yeah, absolutely. I mean, how, how you, 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 uh, you commit to your marketing and your sales and your advertising, uh, that's that's all part of that decision that I think you're talking about right there is, you know, how do you pivot, right? And really, it's a function of diversification is what you're saying. And I think you and I both saw that on the manufacturing side going into the, uh, the Great Recession. Firms, manufacturers, and suppliers that were more diversified and across more vertical markets going into the Great Recession, they did much better uh, going through it and coming out because uh, it could have been that maybe they had one division that did okay. And because that one division did okay during the Great Recession, the others, the other divisions that did very poorly, well, they were able to be sustained essentially, right? You could pull resources, you can move things around. Um, it wasn't a great time, but you certainly did better than the firm that had all of their assets, all of their, their bets in one basket. And when that one basket failed, you know, they didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, so, so to your point, I think diversification in this economy is huge, and and I've been uh, very vocal about the importance of diversifying, especially at a time like now. It's almost getting to be you know the eleventh hour for that, I think. But um, you know, continue to do it. You know, it's it's there's never a bad time to start a good strategy. 
uh, it just may not pay off as great now as it as it would if you had started it maybe a year ago. But still, you know, a, a dominant strategy is a dominant strategy. I think that's a terrific piece of advice for us to end on. Michael, thank you so very much for joining me today. I really enjoyed talking to you. You provided our guest, our, our audience with some amazing insights. And I want to encourage everyone once again to reach out to either Michael or myself uh, if you will have any follow-up questions. Uh, I wanted to highlight that we have a couple of other webinars coming up that I think you'll really enjoy. On August 31st, we have the Wholesale Chain Show with Mike. Eichinger, that's brought to you by Epicor. Uh, the next episode of the Discerning Distributor uh, pod, uh, webcast uh, hosted by yours truly is going to be on September 8th at noon Eastern, brought to you by Oracle NetSuite. Uh, here is all of my contact information. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And uh, as a last comment, I wanted to say again, I Thank you so much to Sam O'Shea at Recurrency and to Epicor for sponsoring this webinar. And I hope you got some value out of it. And I really look forward to joining you again in two weeks to talk more economics, to talk about commodity prices, input prices with another fantastic guest. And I want to say again, thank you to all of you for being here today and have a wonderful day. Take care.